Hi, I'm Tom Daly and welcome to the Lexington Writers Club. As a teacher at Lexington Community Education, it's been my pleasure to help Lexingtonians achieve their dream of bringing their thoughts and experiences to life on the page. On this show, we'll be interviewing some of those writers and we'll find out what it's like to get to be a writer. What are the pitfalls? What are the joys? And maybe in the process, you'll be inspired to write yourselves. So welcome to the show. My guest today is X.J. Kennedy, a poet and uh, anthologist, author of many textbooks and children's books, poetry and novels. Joe is, uh, we we'll call him Joe, that's how his friends and family know him. And maybe you can explain to us why you adopted the pen name X.J. Kennedy. Oh, well, Tom, if your name is uh, Joe Kennedy and you're from Massachusetts, uh, there's, there's an awful lot of people with that name. <laughs> so uh, I tried to pick some name that would be crazy different from the Kennedys uh, on the Cape. Okay. And that's what I came up with. Very good. All right. <laughs> So we could talk about many of Joe's books, for example, any one of his 23 children's books or any of his many books of poetry. Um, I actually did a whole series of exercises on poems in this book in a prominent bar in Secaucus, which is Joe's new and selected poems, 1955 to 2007. I did those for my writing, uh, poetry writing workshop participants but we're going to focus today on two books, uh, more recent books. This is called A Horse, Half-Human Cheer, which Joe calls an entertainment. It's a novel, really. It's a crime novel. And uh, also his poems 2008 to 2016, which is That Swing. So let's start with A Horse, Half-Human Cheer. So this has some autobiographical elements in it. Why don't you tell us about those? Well, uh, the story takes place in a Catholic college uh, in New Jersey um, where, uh, unbeknown to the good priests who run the place, uh, it's really in the hands of the Newark Mafia. And uh, that was true. Uh, the college I went to, the business manager was a Mafia don, and in my senior year, the FBI raided the campus, arrested the business manager, another dean fled to Mexico, <laughs> and in the morning we had a new president. <laughs> you don't want to care to, dis to divulge the name of that institution, do you? Well, uh, it's respectable now, okay. very respectable. Uh, Seton, Hall Seton Hall in yeah. New Jersey, uh, they uh, cleaned up their act, and now it's quite a decent place. Okay. So without giving away what happens, the, the basic story here is that uh, this campus balloons suddenly to 4,000 people at the end of World War II, and it had been a small school, training school for uh, se seminary, uh, right. some seminarians, and... Uh, all of a sudden, there's this all this activity, and this business manager who's in with the mob is selling, you know, Browning rifles and typewriters. He's getting them essentially. The government gives them a surplus, and he sells them and pockets the money for the mob and keeps some for himself. Right. So uh, one of the protagonists in this is the athletic director, whose name is Douglas Knox, a priest. And he's the manager of the basketball team. And he's recruited a young African-American whiz, a uh, guy who's sensational. Uh, and so a lot of the story revolves around this basketball coach and some of the shenanigans that go on between the mob and the team. But I want to, I want to ask you, there's a character named Moon Gogarty. Yeah. Am, I, am I pronouncing that right, Gogarty? Good enough. Okay. <laughs> So Moon is the editor of the newspaper. He gets recruited to do it. Um, there are not many. Most of the 
he's the only, one of the few actual people who matriculated from high school right into college. Most of these students are yeah. GIs, yeah. fresh from World War II. And I was wondering if Moon Gogarty, who got his name because somebody in high school told him he reminded him of Moon Mullins in the, the comic strip, was, is there anything autobiographical about Moon Gogarty? Were you the editor of the paper? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Moon Gogarty is closely allied to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I did edit the student paper and uh, was a sort of uh, uncertain nerd at that stage of my life. And, mm -hmm. So I, I guess it's a fair self-portrait. And uh, was there anybody else who was, besides the business manager, who you're modeling the uh, characters on? Well, there's a, uh, a sex bomb of a woman named Ashley Weinstein, who is uh, sort of a combination of a, a couple of, of women whom I was acquainted with. At the college? Or Actually, no. No, elsewhere. not at the college. Okay. So this Ashley, for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, teaches biology, and she's a very attractive woman, and all these male GIs and kids right out of high school are spending a lot more time paying attention to her than to what she's saying. And she actually has some dalliances with some of them, which, of course, nowadays would get her fired right away if anybody found out about it. Um, I want to really strongly recommend this. I, I found this to be a, a, I couldn't put it down. I read it about three days sitting. It was, oh, good. It was really wonderful. Very fast paced, very funny. There are lots of puns on names. So for example, one of the teams that, uh, that St. Cassius Imola plays is Holy Sepulchre. So for those of you who don't know the, what a sepulchre is, it's the tomb of Jesus. So tell, tell the audience what the name of the team was for Holy Sepulchre. Uh, well, uh, the team, they're called the, the Shrouds. The Shrouds. <laughs> now, the, the team, the, the basketball team for uh, Cassius Imola, which has to be a bit of a pun on Ignatius Loyola, I guess, uh, Anyway, their, their name was the Quills. Explain why Quills is part of their name. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the reason for that name? Yeah, there, there was a Cassius Amola. Oh, there really uh, was a Cassius Amola. Yeah, he was a pedagogue, a teacher, oh, okay. who, according to legend, uh, was stabbed to death by his students using their quill pens. Wow. Good thing we don't have quill pens anymore. <laughs> okay, so, so the quills is another sort of pun. The, naming the team the quills, that's the right. thing that was the, the saint was stabbed to death with. Right. Yeah. I, that, there's so much wonderful humor. Uh, if any of you have any, not any familiarity with Joe Kennedy's poetry, there, there's just great humor in it throughout. I also want to uh, point out that I noticed that, so this is the, the title of this collected poems, 55 to 2007, is a prominent bar in Secaucus. Well, that's a bit of a joke because there wasn't much prominent in Secaucus. It was a pig raising town that smelled a high hell, right? Well, back then, anyway. Back then, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I hear it's a honeymoon spot oh, is for it New now? Yorkers these days. Oh, is it really? It's so close yeah, well, to New York. We don't want to give it a bad name. There was a wonderful movie actually called The Return of the Secaucus Seven. Did you ever see that? I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah. I heard about that. These anti-war activists get pulled over and then they they spend the night in jail in Secaucus. They're on their way to Washington for a demonstration. Uh -huh. So it's a fine movie. I think John Sayles did it. Anyway, um, so, well, anything, anything you want to say about this before we move on to your poetry? Well, uh, the book has been so widely ignored, I'd appreciate anybody reading it. 
<laughs> it really is a wonderful, it's, it's got sex, it's got violence, it's got the mob, it's got athletics, it's got faculty, student relationships, it's got college, it's just brimming with all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the poems in this book, That Swing. First of all, tell, tell us where the title comes from. I mean, I, I think I know, but... Oh, uh, well, uh, because all the poems in the book are written in meter, a regular rhythm, it seemed appropriate uh, to swipe the phrase from uh, Duke Ellington's song, It Don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> do da do da do da do da do da <laughs> So I thought that'd be a good name for metrical poetry. Good. Now, going back to the, the novel, the entertainment, <coughs> Moon Gogarty is always fantasizing about playing in a big band. One minute he's Duke Ellington, one minute he's playing a trombone with somebody else. Yeah. He's, was that your, did you fantasize about that as a, as I a did, kid? yeah. I, I followed all the big bands in those days, which was the, the 40s, 50s, and uh, I had lots of fantasies then. Did you play any musical instrument? Not a one. Not a one. <laughs> so you made your music through poetry. Your poetry is, Joe, uh, unlike a lot of poets nowadays, has stayed faithful to rhyme and meter, and uh, I'm very grateful to that because I have, uh, I'm a big fan of rhyme and meter. Let's uh, have you read this. So there's a poem in here about Thomas Hardy. So Thomas Hardy was a 19th, early 20th century English novelist who was, uh, also was a wonderful poet. And some of you may have seen the movie Roman Polanski made called Tess, which was based on his book Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Uh, his other well-known novels are Far From the Matting Crowd. That's, that's Thomas Hardy, isn't it? Is that Hardy? Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's based on that poem by uh, the, the El Thomas Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. Uh, Jude the Obscure is, is one. Jude the Obscure, the mayor of Casterbridge. Mayor of Casterbridge. Yeah, he was, he's a great novelist. I actually think his... Novel writing is as poetic as any of his poetry. I think his prose is really so. So you have a poem about Thomas Hardy's ob obsequies. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, when Hardy died, it was very curious how he got buried. Um, there was a dispute whether he should be laid to rest cremated and laid to rest in Westminster Abbey in the poet's corner with other famous poets, but Hardy had left instructions to be buried out in Dorset in his, his native locale. So they had to uh, have a big debate what should happen to him. Okay, so I understand you actually have committed this poem to memory. I have. There's a very curious story to this poem, and uh, I understand it's a true story. When uh, my wife and I were last in England, we visited Max Gate, which was the big mansion where Hardy lived, and the guide, the tour guide, swore that this strange story uh, was true. Well, uh, it's, the, the poem tells it, I thought, to, it was a good story for a poem. Okay. You want to recite it for us? Yeah, it goes, When Hardy perished, torn between a country churchyard and the abbey, folks whispered a peculiar tale whose central figure was a tabby. It was decreed that Hardy burn uh, to satisfy each bookish mourner by being honored with an urn of ashes in the poet's corner. But he had chosen other ground, 
his native earth in which to rest. And so a compromise was found. A surgeon probed the great man's breast, dispatched inside a biscuit tin, his excised heart out to the yard of Stimson Church to be secured in ground uh, where Hardy's forebears guard. But uh, soon the sexton coming for the poet's disembodied pumper <laughs> found the tin empty on the floor, the house cat grinning, looking plumper. <laughs> well, what to do? Uh, despairing not, they uh, sheared the cat of all nine lives, interred her in a flowered plot, flanked by the first and second wives, a fate that Hardy uh, might have planned. Uh, ironic, he'd have relished that. A wife on either handless hand, a heart whose casket is a cat. You know, the first time I read that, I didn't, I didn't quite get that the heart was inside the cat. They kill the cat, they bury the cat, so the cat is the casket. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's brilliant. I also thought that the, um, they sheared the cat of all nine lives. So the cat wasn't coming back. That's, that's a wonderful poem. I, I'm very fond of the rhyme of pumper and plumper. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. All right, well, let's turn to another one of the. This is actually the first poem in the collection. It's called Lonesome George. So uh, there are so three poems here that all represent things that happen as a result of your travels. This one takes place in the Galapagos Island. And George is a tortoise who was penned at the Darwin Research Station. And he's, well, tell us about George. Well, George was a very famous land, land tortoise. Uh, he was huge, about four feet long. And uh, he was called Lonesome George because uh, he had never mated. He... Uh, uh, was about a hundred years old, so maybe he could no longer cut the mustard. But uh, all attempts to match him up with a female of a close, similar species were unsuccessful, and George finally died without uh, leaving any offspring. At least as far as we know. There's yeah. An offspring that survived, anyway, that, that were detectable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, why don't you read this to us? <clears throat> Lonesome George. No mate for him exists, last one of his subspecies. He solemnly persists in turning into feces, eelgrass, brown and dry, spine-sprinkled, cactus leaves, straining to catch a fly, dejectedly retrieves blunt head, dead-ending male, lone emblem of despair. He slumps on his kneecaps, tail antennaing the air. For a long moment we bind sympathetic looks. We hold out of our kind, like Rhymed lines, printed books. <laughs> That's a wonderful poem. So, so <clears throat> the speaker of the poem, who is presumably related to you in some way or another, is thinking of himself as the, the end of the line of rhyming poetry and uh, printed books. I hope that's not the case. I, I, hope, not I hope not either. But I actually, rhyme, rhyme, <laughs> is, rhyme is doing very well in 
Other parts of the world, in England, it's still very much honored. Uh, there are some poets who are rhyming nowadays, and it's very, it's very much honored in among songwriters, hip hop, rap artists. You know, so it's it's not oh, yeah. going it's not going away. It's it's an important part of of the way humans express themselves. Um, I want to just again congratulate some of these rhymes: subspecies and feces. Male and tail. <laughs> very, very good. Now, there's a poem that uh, is a little bit, ta well, it talks about the act of writing. This is a poem called How It Happens. And so one of the things that this poem says is, uh, it's basically saying, you know, people think, some people think that poems just sort of spill out, that they're, you know, the inspiration just happens. And the speaker of this poem is saying, well, maybe that's happened uh, 10 times at most in my life. How many poems do you think you've written in your life? A couple thousand? Oh, Lord. Easy. Yeah, 10,000 maybe. So the, the point that, and I want to stress this, especially for people who are trying to write poetry, is that poetry isn't just a sort of, you know, getting that channel to the muse and just, you know, automatic writing. It's, it's a lot of hard work. It's writing line by line. And as this poem says, rhyme by rhyme. Far oftener a poem suggests its rhymes, grants me a word with which, with, with which a word might mate, a seed to plant and carefully cultivate. Hard work runs head, up, head first up against resistance, for who can will a poem into existence? And then the, the poem ends with this wonderful, uh, the moral well may well be, sit on your butt. I think that's great. All right, there was another poem that uh, is also a poem related to tourism. And it's the poem about um, <clears throat> taking a, tourists taking pictures of children in Mali. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yes. Uh, well, Dorothy, my late wife, and I visited Mali, which is perhaps the poorest country in Africa. Uh, you haven't seen poverty till you've been in Mali. And... Uh, Mali is in central or western? Uh, sort of western Africa. Western, yeah, okay. Not far from Senegal. Okay. Um, and I was struck by a tourist taking pictures of poor children there with a camera that was worth <laughs> more than the income of a family in a year. Mm, right. There seemed to be a certain irony there. Yeah. So when, when was that? That that happened about five years ago. Five years ago. Okay, maybe you could read. You could read that. Tourists taking pictures of children in Mali. In a dust-cluttered back street of Bamako, that's the capital. The tourist halts, collects a yelping pack by granting them an instant picture show. Behold, their faces in his camera's back. Whooping, they crowd in, overjoyed to spot a crony framed in liquid crystal display, a naked little sister. It's their lot to live unphotographed until this day when a vacationing wizard from the sky brings them a glowing screen in which to peer, an instrument beyond their means to buy, whose cost might feed a family for a year. A chill besets the tourist. Now he feels his hands upon his pentax clamp like a locks, lest it be stolen. Now he blithely steals these children captives in his light tight box. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, um, a few more minutes. I want to talk about uh, teaching. You were a writing teacher for many years. Is that, did you teach writing or did you teach literature or both? Well, I taught freshman English 
like everybody at Tufts. And uh, I taught uh, American Lit and uh, a, a modern poetry course. Okay. And a poetry workshop in which people wrote poems. So how did you manage, how did you lead the poetry workshop? What was the setup for that? Well, it was the classic uh, setup of uh, people uh, bringing in copies of the poems they had written, passing them around to the other members of the workshop, and then soliciting comments, mm -hmm. which we would throw back and forth and discuss. Did you think the, the participants found the comments useful to improving the poems? There are some leaders of poetry workshops who actually think it's a, um, a vain exercise. You can't really teach anybody how to write. You just, they just have to figure it out themselves. Well, some of the comments may have been useful. Um, if you're in a situation like that, writing poems and showing them to a lot of other people, you have to be able to recognize useful comments and tell them apart from useless ones. Right, right. A lot of people will try to come up with a solution for where they sense there's a problem in this poem, but they really don't know how to fix it. Right, right. So you Did you enjoy that. leading a workshop? Yeah. Yeah. Had you ever participated in a workshop as a as a participant as opposed to a never, teacher? Never did a workshop? Never, no. I was before the, uh, the great age of... The industry of poetry workshops. Creative writing and right. poetry teaching yeah. Yeah. when I was a student at Michigan. So uh, I, you once read, uh, you once wrote someplace in, or said something in an interview that you sort of felt like you were out of time that you had you were came along before the new formalists people like Dana Joya people who sort of revived an interest in rhyme and American poetry would you still feel that way that there was that you were sort of passed by by the the anti poetry sort of spirit I'm sorry anti rhyme spirit in American poetry writing well I, I, I can't ever complain I've had enough attention that's good. That's good. Maybe more than I deserve. I was interested to see in the back of this book that you received an award, and Heather McHugh was on the committee that awarded you. I thought it was actually a very nice uh, comment that they made uh, the, in the citation. They said that, um, so this was Heather McHugh, Vijay Sashadri, and Deborah Warren. They commended Kennedy for, quote, translating the human predicament into poetry perfectly balancing wit, savagery, and compassion. The size of his poems may be small, but their scope is vast. I would certainly agree with that. Well, isn't that a lovely comment? I've, I've been happy ever since. Yeah, that was <laughs> really quite wonderful. That was for the Jackson Prize given by poets and writers in New York. Right. Let's very briefly talk about your children's books because that's probably your almost your most prolific. That is the most recent one. This is the most recent city one. City Kids, yeah. And so this is uh, rhymes about, about kids in the city? That's right. Why don't you read this one here, The Man with the Tan Hands. <clears throat> the man with the tan hands who stands and scoops up roast chestnuts in cups of old news, folded like perching birds, sold me a few new words. <laughs> That's great. Trying show, to get all the rhymes close show to Show the me. illustration. Well, here, let's just show the illustration to the camera. It's really wonderful. Um, so to close, we got about a minute and a half. I, I just want to mention the fact that the fact that you write for children and also for adults, it seems to me that you have a sense of play in a lot of your poems for adults, and I'm, I haven't read many of your poems for kids, but I'm sure that, that that's, to me, an intersection in your, in your talents and in your spirit. Would you agree with that, that, that playfulness is, characterizes your adult poetry as well as your children's poetry? 
Oh, yeah, well, I think all poetry has to be a little bit playful, mm-hmm. whether for kids or anybody else. Right, right. And did you, who were your inspirations uh, for that spirit in poetry? Was there anybody in particular that... Well, when I started writing children's poems, uh, it was a time back in, oh, the late 40s, early 50s, when uh, many, many good poets were writing for kids. Were they? Yeah. Theodore Retke, for one. Wasn't Randall Jarrell writing? Randall Jarrell. Yeah. Many more. John Charty. That's great. And uh, I found that very encouraging. Well, listen, I want to, we got to wrap this up, but I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Lexington Writers Club. I want to encourage all of you out there to get a copy and read uh, Horse Half Human Cheer, which is, Joe calls it an entertainment, and That Swing, poems 2008 to 2016. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Tom, so very much.